Chapter Six of Night of Molokai by Eva K. Betts. It was hard for Damien to believe that he was really at the islands where his life as a missionary was to begin. The eager travelers had watched them all day, first mere gray smudges on the horizon, then taking on shape, and now, on the following morning, near and vivid in all their breathtaking beauty. Breezes from the land were scented with the odor of exotic flowers, and though the mountains stood tall and forbidding, the gentle waves on the beaches seemed to ripple a welcome. "'You will be glad to land, I'm sure,' said Captain Gherkin to Damien. "'But I must warn you, you'll find walking a little difficult for a while.' "'Why should that be?' Damien asked. "'Because you have sea legs now. You're accustomed to a rolling and pitching deck.' "'Ah, but that will not make it hard when I'm on firm, stable land.' "'Wait and see,' the captain laughed. "'You'll walk as if you had drunk too much schnapps. "'I know. I've seen it. "'Won't you do the same?' "'No. Sailors develop a sort of rolling gait "'that keeps them steady, whether afloat or ashore. "'It's not pretty, but it's safe.' "'The wharf on which the missionaries debark "'was filled with interested Hawaiians or Kanakas. "'Tall, gentle, handsome people,' They watched with fascination as the six white robe missionaries and the ten nuns came down the gangplank. These natives were a kindly group, but found it difficult not to laugh aloud at the picture they saw, for to the people who had lived so long aboard the wood, the wharf and the ground beyond it seemed strangely wavering, and their own steps wavered to match. This is the oddest sensation. Damien was torn between amusement and annoyance. I know that the ground can't be moving, but I feel as if it were surging up to meet my foot or else plunging away from me. He glanced at the nuns, trying to be dignified, but walking for all the world as if they were tipsy. He had no trouble choking back a chuckle, for just at that moment he himself reeled and staggered. What a way to enter my new missionary land, he thought. But he was not yet ready to start as apostolate. On the vigil of Easter, he received the subdiaconate, a further step toward the priesthood and was sent to college at Oumane for a final study period of two months before ordination. In May 1864, Sherman had begun his march to the sea. Japan and France signed a pact of friendship. Italy, Brazil, and Spain discussed the possibility of undersea telegraph lines to America, and on May 21st, Damien received holy orders. Now and forever, he would be Father Damien. Almost at once, he and Father Clement, ordained on the same day as Damien, were assigned to work on Hawaii, the largest island of the group. He could hardly wait to start on his missionary life. I wish I knew more of the language, he said to himself, and had had more time to talk with older men who have been in the field for years. He paced the garden walk, his mind churning, trying to leap from the quiet place in which he was to the yet unseen and unknown parish to which he would soon go. I hope I have plenty of work to do, he mused. I like to work, and in such a cause. The thought remained unfinished, as a wave of joy and gratitude swept over him. He, Joseph de Wooster of Chimaloo, was now an ordained priest in the mission service. He wondered if the natives would like him, wondered not for any reason of self-conceit, but because he knew that if they liked him, they would listen to him. He burned with zeal for the opportunity to tell these pagan children of God about their father and savior and about his church. Along with Father Clement, who had been ordained at the same time, he was to be stationed on the island of Hawaii. The bishop, now making the pastoral rounds of his island diocese, would take them with him to their stations. One hot June night, therefore, the three embarked on a little ship. The first stop was the island of Maui, where three priests were stationed. I wish I could stay longer with those three veteran missionaries, said Father Damien, as the party returned to the ship. There was so much they could teach me. You are young, replied the bishop. But so were they once. I have studied my theology, Damien went on, but I know little about how to teach these pagans. How to... There is the broat whistle, the bishop interrupted. Let us hurry. The captain will not wait. Damien felt keen disappointment at being cut off before making his deep desire clear, but he had learned obedience and did not argue. There was nothing, however, to prevent his speaking to God about the matter. A strange thing happened. The ship was hardly away from the pier, when a cry of fire was heard. Father Clement, where is the bishop? Is he safe? Father Damien, who had been on deck when the alarm was given, rushed to the gangway. I am here, Father Damien, said the bishop quietly. 
Let us see if there is anything we can do to be of help. There must be no panic aboard. There was none. The boat put back, and the bishop went ashore with the two young men to spend the night where Father Damien had longed to be, with the three kindly experienced missioners. He was delighted to talk again with them, to learn more of the many things they could so easily teach. The three hosts were somewhat surprised when the three guests, so lately departed, returned for a longer stay. The bishop and his party would have to remain at Maui until another ship came by, and no one was just sure when that would be. The bishop was impatient to get on about his affairs, but the delay was completely to Damien's taste. He adopted Father Albert as his teacher and began learning the Hawaiian language, throwing himself into this new project with all the furious energy he lavished on any task, physical or mental. Secretly he hoped that a ship would be a long time in arriving. Although he was anxious to get to his mission field, he well knew that the ability to speak to the people easily in their own tongue would bring him much closer to them. The days passed, and Father Damien became steadily more proficient in the new language. Side by side with his growing skill, there grew a great desire to put it to use. Hesitantly, he asked for permission to go to one of the mission churches about fifteen miles away, and there preach his first sermon. His request was granted. The walk seemed short to him. The heat went unnoticed. He strode over the rough ground, his heart singing. He was on his way to speak from the pulpit for the first time and nothing else mattered. He began his sermon very easily, but after a moment or two, the words seemed to desert him. He cleared his throat and went on a little farther with the instruction he had planned, while the Hawaiians sat in rigid politeness. He stumbled, stopped, started again. Now the language of which he had believed himself to be master began playing strange tricks with him. He pulled a large handkerchief from his pocket and mopped his perspiring forehead, and as he did so, he caught just the faintest indication of a twinkle in the eye of one of the men of the congregation. A flash of embarrassed anger flared up for just an instant. Then the humor of the situation struck him. Father Damien smiled widely at his patient and polite flock, and they smiled back. He returned to his preaching, this time going slowly and selecting his words with care. He was not discouraged when he left the church, and on the long hike back to the house where he was staying, he outlined another sermon determined that this time he would be better prepared. His mind was still busy with plans for perfecting his Hawaiian and with other plans for future use of the language when he reached the home of the three priests. He was eager to tell them, as well as the bishop and Father Clement, all about his experience. For a moment he did not comprehend what Father Albert was telling him. The bishop and Father Clement have gone, Father Damien. Gone? Father Damien repeated the word as if he had never heard it before. Yes, a ship came while you were away. The bishop tried to get the captain to wait for a while, but he could not, so they left to go on about their business. Left? Father Damien echoed again. Then complete realization came to him. You mean that Father Clement has gone to his parish, and the bishop on his visitation, and I am left behind? You state the case exactly. Father Albert could not restrain a small smile at the perturbed young giant who towered over him. I have confused matters, it seems, said Father Damien penitently, but very soon he cheered up. He could not be truly sorry that, because of the unexpected arrival of a ship, he was to have a little more time for work and study under the guidance of the three missioners. He had not been at fault, as far as he could see. The June sun in Hawaii is not kind. It thins the blood and saps the strength, even of those who are accustomed to it. But it seemed only to give more vigor to Father Damien. Tirelessly, morning, noon, and night, he strode about the island, working among the people. Dedicated as the three resident priests were, it tired them even to think about the miles Father Damien tramped on Maui. At last, another ship bound for Hawaii put in. This time, Father Damien was aboard in good season. He planned to catch up with the bishop and Father Clement at the latter's newly dedicated chapel, and go on from there to his own parish. But when he reached Father Clement's church, he found that he was late again. The bishop had moved on. Now he was deeply disturbed. Would the bishop think him too unreliable to be put in charge of a parish? He set out on foot to cut across the island, hoping in this way to make better time than the bishop would on the little coastal steamer with its many stops. For a time, while still in the settlement, he walked along with the postman who started him upon his way. But all too soon he was alone, to find, as best he could, the route over a hundred and fifty miles of mountain and gorge and riverland. 
Now the guardian angel, on whom he had always relied, would have plenty to do. He struck off into the wilderness which lay between him and the district of Puna, where among the volcanoes he was to have his pastorate. Once away from the shore, the heat became heavy and humid. Leaves of vine and tree were covered with a fine red dust, brought in by the trade winds. Climbing grew more and more difficult, but Father Damien plunged on. I have twice lagged and missed the bishop, he told himself sternly. I must reach Puna while he is there. Late one afternoon he came to a high plateau. The air was somewhat lighter there, and his powerful body cried for rest. But ahead of him he could see a cloud-capped mountain, over which he must pass, and he decided to get as near to it as possible before sleeping. If he could attack that dreadful climb while fresh from a night's rest, he could make more speed in the ascent. As he drew nearer, the mountain looked more and more formidable. Obstacles are meant to be conquered, Father Damien told himself resolutely. We will attend to that one tomorrow. The obstacle did not look any less awesome when viewed in the light of day. He saw, too, that there was a deep gorge between the spot where he stood and the mountain that he must climb, but his courage did not falter. A gorge and a mountain blocked his path. Then he would go through the gorge and over the mountain. And what of the difficulties of descent on the other side of the mountain? Those he would take care of when he met them. And take care of them he did. Rushing mountain stream, treacherous ravine, heat of day, cold of night. He tramped the whole hundred and fifty miles and met his bishop as he had hoped. Four days later, with instructions from his superior, he left for his own district of Puna. There, at last, he would begin to preach, teach, baptize. In his tremendous district there were only three hundred and fifty Catholics. Some others who had been Catholics, in the years when there had been no resident priest, had fallen, or been drawn, away. Many others were still pagan, making offerings to Pile, the goddess of volcanoes, who, according to Kanaka belief, lived in one of the great volcanoes of Puna. The few Catholic chapels which had existed were now fallen into disrepair or ruin. Another man might have been discouraged by this situation, but not Father Damien. He welcomed the outlet it gave for his spiritual and bodily vigor. His flashing smile as he worked was one of the things that first endeared him to his new parishioners. He started a trip around Puna, making friends with Catholic and non-Catholic alike. When he could, he borrowed a horse or a mural. When he couldn't, he walked. It took three days of traveling to complete the circuit of his parish. A joyous journey for him, because in the trip he had thirty baptisms. His gratitude to God was almost inexpressible. His next step must be the construction of some chapels. Now, the skills he had learned in the years on his father's farm came into play. He designed the little chapels, directed their building, and did much of the heavy labor himself. While busy with the manual work, he never, of course, lost sight of the spiritual needs of his people. He taught, catechized, trained, instructed. Gradually, Catholicity in Puna began to be a vigorous, vital force. In the meantime, his friend, Father Clement, had been working in the district of Cahola in Hamakia. This was a tremendous mountainous area, and before long it was obvious that a man of rare stamina was needed there. Father Clement was somewhat frail, so after eight months in Puna, Father Damien exchanged parishes with him. Now the challenge facing him was even greater than before, and he met it by throwing himself even more enthusiastically into his work. Eighty miles long and thirty miles wide, his district had fifteen Roland chapels to be replaced, and countless souls to be won to God. He was unceasingly busy. Where is your home, Father? Kanaka asked him once when they met on a dangerous mountain trail. Father Damien, standing beside his horse, pointed to the saddle with a smile. That's my home, he answered. One day a messenger came to tell him of an old man who was dying, as for years he had lived, all alone. He had not been to church in a long time, and was anxious to see a priest before he died. Will you lead me to him? asked Father Damien. I will go part of the way, Father, and direct you how to go the remainder of the trip. Father Damien mounted his horse and started off through the jungle. He and his guide saw little animal life, but from the crackling of twigs and rustling of leaves in the bushes and vines on either side of them, they knew that bright eyes were watching and noting them. Now I must leave you, Kamiano, said the Kanaka. You will stay on this path until you reach the top of that mountain. The cabin is there. With thanks to the man, Father Damien went off alone. The sun was now directly overhead, and the steam in the air made breathing difficult. The horse was tiring. Come on, old friend, said the priest encouragingly. You can't quit now. 
We must get to that poor sick man before he goes to meet his maker. The horse seemed to respond to his tone, and for a while went more swiftly. But the trail grew steeper. As they climbed, vegetation disappeared except for a few scraggy bushes and discouraged-looking vines. Father Damien's mount had to pick its way carefully between sharp rocks, where a rolling stone might spell disaster for both animal and rider. The zigzag course became every instant more difficult. At last they came to a sudden, steep rise, which seemed to offer no foothold at all. The horse refused to try the ascent. Father Damien dismounted and surveyed the situation. He could see a few crevices offering possible finger and toe holds. Grasping the reins tightly, he scrambled up the steep slope to the little plateau above. From this vantage point he could see that, a few yards to the left, rough stones lay about it in such a way as to permit the horse to scramble up, if he could be induced to try. The priest walked carefully over to the place of possible ascent and gave a little jerk to the reins. The horse at first stood immovable, but Father Damien continued his play on the reins, his encouraging talking and clucking. At last the animal put a cautious forefoot on a large rock, hesitated a moment, then decided to chance an effort. Its shoes struck sparks from the rock, it slipped and nearly fell, but at last, with a mighty heave, it was up on the ledge. The relieved rider at once leaped into the saddle and was on his way. He reached the old man in plenty of time to hear his confession, anoint him, and comfort him before he died. End of chapter 6